Hello and welcome to the Thursday episode of the 905er and the 905 Roundup. My name is Roland Tanner. I am Joel McLeod. And it's September the 6th as we record this. It will be September the 8th when you hear this, I suspect. And it's uh, the day that the uh, schools open up again. The kids happily trot off with their... uh, with their satchels and, and sandals in their school uniforms to uh, to eager to begin learning for another year. <laughs> if if you didn't if you didn't date yourself as a as a Brit expat, <laughs> you just did. Because <laughs> there, there, right now there are a lot of, there are a lot of parents going like I, I've never sat send my kid off with a satchel in my life. Uh, but you're right. It, it's uh, it's back to school season, and it's um, you know it. it Parents are wondering how is this year going to be different from the previous two, I guess three, uh, technically three, I, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, because I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to rehash the last two years because we've all, you know, if you were a parent like I am, you, we all know, we all, we all share the same shame, knowing glance, the knowing glances and this, you know, the, the, the head nods of, of, uh, you know, we've, we've been through some stuff, but, you know, parents are, are concerned about, is this going to be the year that we finally see a full school year uh, back, uh, you know, from, from start to finish, right? Like a, a, a relatively normal school year. And I, for one, want that to be. I, I'm really hoping that the, that this year is a back to normal year. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for us and my, my fingers are crossed. But there's um, the reason why I wanted to bring it up is because there's a, you know, there's, there's talk it, it there's just there's this I hate that haze in the in the in the sky that says you know things are not all copacetic first off let's let's talk to or hit the talk about the elephant in the room and that's covid um parents are are there's a concern that schools will be see a spike in covid cases if you're a parent last year you, chances are your school your kid's school saw at some point just massive absences of kids uh because someone in the family or they themselves or somebody got COVID and they had to stay home and just saw like classrooms potentially half empty teachers were sick and they were, so there's this, you know, you didn't even know if your kid's teacher was going to be there for the end of the school year. It was, it's been a bit of chaos, but we kind of just crept across the finish line barely. And the question now is like, okay, like, you know, how are we turning this around? The, the this government, you know, Stephen Lecce, the Minister of, Fi- of Education, sorry, um, is saying no. Come hell or high water, schools will stay open. They are not closing schools for COVID or any other uh, reasons like that. Yet, you have to ask, like, what what happened? What happens if case numbers get up to a point that you know we, we can't ignore it? And I find I find that 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 in itself is a bit telling. I mean, I'm not I'm not advocating well, let's lock down schools. Nobody wants that, but you kind of want to know. Like, do you have a plan? Like, is there a plan to, you can say we're going to keep them open no matter what, but is there a plan there? And that's what I think that's where this government is falling short is in that reassurance of, yes, you know, taking out the plan off the shelf, showing it says, read it. This is it. This is what we're going to do. If, uh, if uh, things start to get bad, we see case numbers starting to get up there and you know, schools become a hot spot. This is what we're going to do. Uh, I mean, Schools will be a hotspot. Uh, my understanding is the numbers are already rising. Uh, I was speaking to someone earlier this evening who's just been exposed, to, you know, had direct mm. contact with someone with COVID. He, that person, had quite a not not a, not a terrible experience first time around, but certainly not a pleasant experience mm-hmm. first time around. And it's like, oh, gee, thanks. You know, uh, here we go again. Um, you know there there were, you know, and I don't want to spread rumors, but you know, there are stories in in seemingly fairly reputable sources about you know people who are catching it for the second or third time, and that, that there are sort of cumulative effects. Or you know there was a story today about uh, effects on brain function and stuff like this. But I think we also have to accept. Well, the assholes won uh, when it comes to COVID nineteen. Um, the my knowledge, my understanding is that that you know um, there's no, <laughs> despite all the protests, there are no mandates in schools. Um, it was hard enough to keep 
to ask children to keep their masks on, certainly the younger children to keep their masks on, when when it was actually an order that they had to do it. Um, mm-hmm. Now uh, they don't. Uh, my understanding is that the vast, vast majority of children do not and will not be wearing masks of any kind. I think most teachers, if not all teachers, pretty much have had COVID by now at least once. Um, and we're asking them to be on the front line of a kind of medical experiment in a lot of ways. Um, right. Uh, well, you know, but but what are we going to do? It's no one wants to talk about COVID anymore. No one wants to right. stay home anymore. Uh, I suspect they won't close. I mean, you know, they're not going to say it out loud in the way that Boris Johnson did, but basically let the bodies pile up as they may. We're going back to work. Um, mm-hmm. And the school, particularly well, the elementary and lower levels of school, are basically an essential are basically child care for people who who have families which are the vast majority of families right. who who um who uh, both go out to work and, and don't have anybody to look after young children it's 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 that simple um, well here's but here's where i think i think it gets a little bit uh complicated why the government wants to turn away from covid uh, you know a credible covid plan um you know we're, we're so we're, we're going away from covid we're we're trying to get out of it and put it behind us whether we'll succeed history will determine that uh but what we're going into is union uh union talks you know that's what that's the next thing that we're hearing on the on the horizon is uh you know qp qp right now is up for uh up for uh renegotiation they're they're at the table saying okay this is what we want to see for our members and this is kind of you know ever all the other unions in the in the teaching industry uh bad bad choice of words i'm afraid uh but in in the teaching field all the other unions are kind of looking at them as the first as the first ones into the fray you know how 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 are their how is their negotiations negotiations going to work out and the entire the eyes of the promise are on this and the reason why i is because you know like what will the the public attitude be towards a strike and i i think Patience is very thin amongst parents and the public at, at large with between all the various lockdowns that have happened. Um, you know, here's the thing, like those lockdowns were a result of Minister Lecce. Like I, I know I remember as a parent at the start of the pandemic and for two years, every time he came on the microphone and he said, oh, we're going to give it, we're going to have an announcement. And every parent stopped what they were doing to tune in. Like, am I going to, am my kid going to be in school tomorrow? Was basically the question that everyone in the province had on their mind. And it was frustrating because nine times out of 10, it was Stephen Lecce going up to the microphone saying, I have an announcement that I'll be making an announcement tomorrow. And like, really, like, and then people were frustrated and walked away. And I think this government burnt a lot of goodwill amongst parents during the pandemic. Uh, and it still carries over. And all that they want a majority, but I think that's more uh, a failure of the NDP and the uh, Liberal Party to capitalize on that than anything else. But that 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 frustration, that anger, still exists. At least amongst parents, I'm 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 aware of. Now we're going to negotiations, and you know if we can declare essentially COVID is over, no more COVID. That's not an issue. Now we're getting right down to tax dollars to pay. QP, so your janitorial, your secret, your your administrative support staff, all those folks that help make a school run. Then, after that, teachers uh, as well. If we can start saying, okay, we're going into a into a negotiation. If they decide to strike, if they don't accept what we give them, and your your kid's school is now closed because of a strike, it's their fault now, not ours. That's what this is about. And I. I don't know if that's going to necessarily fly because I think patience is just fed up and it might be a bit of a pox on both your houses situation from, from the public, mostly because here's the thing you can, you can go to, you know, the right now QP is asking for, I believe 11.7% pay increase uh, for their members. The government is saying, no, you get two, your, your highest paid member gets uh, uh, two, uh, or sorry, your your high, your your lowest paid member gets two percent. Your your highest gets one and a half. That's it. Pay increase. And 
you know, like that's a that's a really tough pill to swallow to say. Like, okay, like you know, we're, we're saving. Like, what are, what are we saving here? You know, what, what, how, how's this going to play out? I don't know. Well, a simple matter is inflation's running at. What is inflation running at right now? Ten percent, eleven percent, more than two percent. Well, hell of a lot more than two percent. Um, you know, you. Yeah, I mean that. So a two percent pay increase is a eight percent pay cut. Uh, I mean, you know, I, my math oh, isn't good it, enough to do to calculate the exact numbers there. But but it, it, this is a real a real terms cut that has been proposed, and, and you know the teachers will say that they and and they have a point under this government and previous governments they they've seen their salaries whittled away and it may be whittled away from a fairly healthy position but it but um but you know this was always on the cards with this government this this is the teachers and the pc party of ontario are like the coal miners and margaret thatcher in britain you know this uh, this is this is the fight that they want to see, happen Roland, Roland, you should have picked every <laughs> every high school english teacher's favorite subject shakespeare they're they're the montagues and capulets they <laughs> But you're right. But you see, if they want, you remember, they want to kill them. that. You the, they want to kill the teachers' unions. Yes. They want to destroy the teachers' unions as 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 a force because they think they're too strong. Because you know, teachers in Ontario, compared with teachers in many other jurisdictions around the world, are not badly off. But hey, look, you look at the statistics, and schools in Ontario have some of the best results in the world. You know, you yep. get what you pay for, oh. and Ontario teachers are, are pretty damn good as a general rule. Don't for, don't also forget. Prior to the pandemic, or if you flash back to March 2020, it seems a lifetime ago, we had rotating strikes in this province as they were in the midst. Like, this isn't new. This isn't a an unreasonable thing. This is back to basics for this government of let's pick a fight with the unions. Prior to the pandemic, our unions were in a fight with the government over, pay, over the contract that they're currently in. Uh, because, and, but they only signed because of the pandemic. The notion was we got it. We just got to solve this thing because we got this pandemic to fight. And everyone said, "Okay, fine, sign an agreement, take it." Yeah, and it's, walk it's, off. It's, it's, a, it's a battle postponed. Yeah, from March 2020. Um, yeah, of course they 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 want to fight. Um, this is the fight that the you know in so far as the PC, PC government has any principles, it's to stick the boot to its enemies um whether those are people in municipalities whether it's you know personally personal grudges against patrick brown or whoever uh, or the city of toronto or uh, or you know above all sticking it to teachers because teachers have unions that are that are have been very effective over the decades uh, at getting good deals for their members which you know in case we forget is just what unions are supposed to do, just like your lawyer is supposed to get you a good deal yeah. um, when you go to court. But um, there's one there's one thing that I think people should keep in mind is there's a the zeit, the, the zeitgeist, if you will, has changed from tw from March of 2020. Um, post COVID, post pandemic, we're seeing the what you know everyone's reads it in the paper. You pick up a paper, you read it. The Great Resignation, the Great you know, people are leaving jobs on mass um because of poor working conditions now the i'm not saying we're going to see a mass t uh, teacher shortage i hope not but here's the thing if if this government decides well i'm going to go pick a fight and i'm going to go and get i'm going to give these unions peanuts two percent best i can offer and i'm going to break you to 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 do it there's nothing stopping down the roads, teachers say, "Well, I'm not getting my fare. I, 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 I know what I'm worth. I know what I know what I want. I'm going to go get it. I'm leaving." And here's the thing: like that's what that's kind of the long term that I'm worried about is if te if the teachers don't they they start to lose that 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 feeling of I'm respected uh, for the job that I'm doing. If it's a matter of like you're paid too much, you know, you work for me and you're paying you too much. Meh. They'll eventually the teachers will just say, I'm not, this isn't worth it. I'm leaving. We see it in the States. We see it like there's massive teacher shortages amongst the states of all those Republican right leaning states that said, oh, we're going to stick it to the teachers because that's going to save us tax dollars. And we're going to, teachers don't deserve to be paid that much. And there's this race to the bottom in those states 
we're seeing teachers leaving the profession en masse for other jobs uh, or just leaving the state uh, state in, in question. And schools are finding, well, we don't have enough teachers just to teach basic, you know, math, reading and, 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 uh, and writing at the basic level in our, in our school system, forget the, you know, the trades programs, the science programs and the history and art and all that stuff that we want to see in, in schools. They're, ba- they're having basic needs not being met. And I, you know, you say, oh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, hyper, it's hyperbole, Joel, is what you're, you're shouting into the microphone. Maybe, but it starts somewhere. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm saying, is 2% a little insulting in the face of two, three years of uncertainty being going going into a covid factory for two years essentially a, a, a petri dish and saying the best i can offer you is two percent and you say i'm not saying you have to give them the 11 but you know come up me say i'll meet you halfway can i meet you halfway and i'd be like that's a fair deal that's a that would be a fair a fair offer to uh to the unions and if the unions still reject them like you guys are morals but coming in two percent is just a slap in the face and quite frankly i say you know what, fine, then, you know, give them the finger, throw open the door and say, clean up your own mess. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it is like night follows day, conservative government unrest with teachers because yeah. they, they, you know, the, 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 the people in charge of the education system never used the damn education system. I mean, True. specifically, Lecce did not go to a public school. I mean, uh, it, but yeah, I mean, if the te- teachers were on the front lines of this thing, um, because, you know, even if there were times when teaching was being done from home, uh, there were also times when it was mixed and some were having to go into work, mm-hmm. uh, whether they wanted to or not. Um, and um, uh, it, yeah, they're, they're part of, like I say, a kind of medical experiment, um, you know, and yeah eventually they got ppe i believe which is reasonably good but it took a long time uh to arrive you know if you're working in a hospital you probably had decent ppe from day one now long-term care different story um but um all all the all the uh professions where people were in those kinds of jobs where they just had to go and be in contact with covid uh whether they liked it or not um i think deserve credit and deserve you know leniency right. when it comes to to uh I look to at, pay demands. I look at this way when in the second world war because if we, i'm going to bring up the second world war analogy because if everyone remembers at the start of this pandemic we were told it's going to be like to defeat covid we're going to have to think like society did in the second world war you know all hands on deck put all the resources into defeating this virus and we did and teachers were a big part of that now if you want to think of teachers and the nurses and and doctors, they were on the front lines of this uh, pandemic. They were they were our our first line of defense. And I think it's a little disheartening that, you know, in the Second World War, our veterans came back from that war, and we found them college, you know, money for college degrees, money for housing, uh, uh, money to help them start businesses, and we we found ways to reintegrate them, you know. You, you went off and you, you defeated fascism, you defeated the Nazis, you, you, you won, you secured our freedom. You deserve this. You de- well, we're going to find the money because you deserve this. You, you, you bled and you lost limbs and, and you, you fought for us over there. You deserve that while you're here. Where was that, where's that attitude now for the teachers and the nurses and the doctors who, who helped us keep this you know the, our society going and our kid our, gave our kids a, try to make our kids a, a safe place for them to to go and it kind of just like where, where is that attitude where, why are we now like let's go pick a fight with them it, it's just yeah, i mean i, I think i think to be honest you know if the analogy of this this is the closest thing our generation is going to have to an event like the second world war then we lost the war we quit we gave up we were divided by fifth columnists who went and marched about masks uh we've lost the war covid is here to stay it's not under control it's never going to be controlled probably we're hope hopefully the 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 scientists will keep on pumping out the uh new uh 
vaccines, hopefully new vaccines, better vaccines, whatever, uh, to to keep the thing at a, at a reasonable level. But basically, you know, we're talking about the population as a whole, about our political leadership, you know, exclusive, excluding the scientific part from the equation. We fucked this up from beginning to end. We lost. We capitulated. We were bums. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to pay with a price for the rest of our lives. So, so be it. That's the decision that we made as a society. But yeah, compare us to those people who fought through the Second World War across the well, across the whole planet, and who you know when that war was over said you know never again. We'll have homes built for heroes. We'll have a health system that's decent. We'll make sure that everybody's educated well. Now this this is out of this horror will come something much better. And I remember us talking about that on, on early episodes of this, of the yep. podcast saying, yep. you know, hopefully some good things come from this or maybe the work from home thing is, is a benefit we can point to, but no, we didn't win this war. We lost it. It's over. We're done. And yeah, I'm yeah. kind of mad. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I am too. And I, I just, I'm, I'm my I guess a lot of parents are looking at this and we're worried about the year to come and, um, are we still going to be this disruptive? Like, are we not going to have a, a year of just peace and learning? I don't know. I'm going to leave it at that because I see we're coming up on, a, on our break. Uh, so we're going to take a break and come back with the second half of the episode. Okay, and we're back, folks. Uh, steering clear of our, our, uh, our, our battered school system. Uh, let's take a look at our battered municipal electoral system. <laughs> Yeah, 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 we really must try and find a good news story, but you know, I don't know. I think they say bad news gets more listeners or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I didn't really anticipate this being such a grim episode. But um, <laughs> with the municipal election, yeah, I mean, it just, just this isn't really a story. It's just something that piqued my interest this morning, and it just we'll start off with an example and and go from there to the sort of broader point that I, I think is of interest. Uh, and that's uh, a candidate in Hamilton, Cameron Kretsch, who some may know um, was involved in uh, various stories during the last few years at Hamilton City Hall, was the chair of the LGBTQ uh, Ad Citizen Advisory Committee, uh, is now running for the second time in, I believe, Ward 2? Ward 2. That, yeah, okay. Um, and he just, just tweeted something this morning um, about a developer in the ward who had uh, approached him for a meeting and he and he had that meeting that's all good and then ha the developer had made a um, a donation to to uh, Cameron's campaign for twelve hundred dollars which is I believe still the maximum amount um, which he re returned sort of um, saying you know sorry I can't accept donations from a developer now I should point out it will have been a personal check not a corporate check um, so nothing illegal. This is all completely by the book, completely allowed. Um, but yeah, the first part of this is it illustrates how you know, if anybody's donating twelve hundred dollars in a campaign, well, they're okay. either a candidate or a, or a developer in all likelihood. But we but we also need to point out that this developer is has a has a purpose or, or, or a motive towards this. There's a, a sign that's gone up uh, at I believe one twenty four. Wall Street, no, uh, yeah. Well, I, I want at a site in uh, in Hamilton, one twenty four Wall Street South. Um, uh, basically, to you know, to say that they want they want to develop it. Um, and there's a poem on the sign. I'm not going to read it, but it's a uh, you know to basically they're anti homeless. You know, they they don't they don't want the the houseless uh, on the site and and one and I kind of that might be a different argument. But the the point is that it's clearly at this person i don't want to say they were trying to bribe cameron but they were definitely trying to i, I don't know why else you would you would get you would meet with them and then hand over a check to a candidate well yeah I, 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 you made the point before we came on the air and i'll reiterate it and pretend it's my point <laughs> which is nobody donates anything certainly not twelve hundred dollars without you know there's oh, no I, such thing as as a as a completely 
free donation of twelve hundred dollars. No, we just like you. No, I'm. Oh, yeah, and, and, and we should also says, put, we should also add in that this person in question is now registered as a third party advertiser in the in the municipal election. Yeah, um, and is a- actively promoting another uh, another candidate, um, who I'm going to presume got that twelve hundred dollars. But I mean that that's. We don't know. I mean, we don't know. I, I'm, I, that's me entirely I, I, hyper, I hyper, hyper uh, uh, assuming, and I have no evidence. Yeah, that, and, so and Cameron said he wasn't even sure that the candidate that they're now supporting was aware of the fact that they were being supported. Fair um, I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. It's it's more the general principle of the thing here that yes. I think is of interest, which is that um, you know the idea that corporate donations were banned when corporate donations were banned is completely false corporate donations are alive and well they're just written on personal checks um and and uh, you know any candidate who's getting a 1200 dollars donation from someone is if it's not a family member if it's not the candidate themselves it's probably someone with significant business interests who's who's behind that donation and they're you know they're wanting something in return that i mean it doesn't have to be a as overt as a quid pro quo that anybody openly discusses but the donations were always you know why did pfizer picking at random donate huge amounts of money to the liberals and to to all the parties um because they want access like exactly well i mean you heard what when the liberals changed the laws, there's the the pay for access scandal. Ooh, such a scandal! And I think the the reason why the liberals were so, uh, like Kathleen Wynne, I think was caught, un like just kind of shocked by the by it as a scandal, is that it, it in all honesty, it wasn't really a scandal. Like every party did it. That's the thing. Like you you do not give money. You don't give money to a candidate or to a to a party or to a campaign. Um, out of the goodness of your heart. I'm sorry, it just does not happen. Like, the ones who do give for the goodness, I really like you. I like you, Roland. I want you you in, pa- in the office. I'm going to cut you a check. At best, it's 100 bucks. If I walk up to you and I'm like, do you want a, you want a 1200 or a, a 1500 whatever the maximum limit is now? Do you want the, the top donation, Roland? Okay, but I want your number. I, I want I, I, When I come calling at your office, you take time to listen to what I have to say. That's what yeah. that's about. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I can remember somewhere, somewhere, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, this cash for access. It's like, of course it's cash for access. That's, that's the whole point. You, yeah. you have you have a get together at, at a fancy house or a fancy location. You you have a couple of glasses of wine. You eat some cold cuts and um, and, and, you, and you pay $1,200 to meet the minister for five minutes, shake the hand and, well, and say, hey, don't forget me. Um, I remember, I remember two elections ago. You had uh, Doug Ford caught on camera meeting, literally meeting with the heads of Madame e and Green Park and all the developers, and he was caught on camera in a fundraiser, saying, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tear up the green belt for you guys." He got caught. And, oh no, I'm, I'll, I'll not do that. And you know, he still won the election. But it's, it's just well, and, that's, that's, and, what, and, how, that's how the, our elections work. And ironically, at the time, the, the way the, the the liberals were interpreting the law that they brought in was that. Um, politicians could not be present at fundraisers at all um so which makes fundraisers very difficult because like who the hell wants to go to a fundraiser with a bunch of volunteers well let me tell you nobody (laughs) even the volunteers don't want to go um uh you know and what the upshot of all this is is that you know i'm not saying that we should go back to corporate donations but at least under the old system a, a journalist could go and look at the donation record and say, okay, Pfizer donated this much to this party and this much to this party. Matsumi donated this much to this party. Uh, he donated to this this riding and this riding and this candidate and this leadership thing. Now it's guesswork because the donation, you know, the, the secretary of... Uh, or the PA of the CEO of such and such is makes a donation for twelve hundred dollars. Well, that's awfully coincidence, coincidental, isn't it? But you know how you know, <laughs> given the, the sort of parlous state of the the uh, journalism profession, no fault of the journalists, just the fact that there are no jobs for them anymore. 
how the hell is anybody going to sort of track their way through that and say, you know, why the hell is the personal assistant or the secretary or the wife or the grandmother or the 14-year-old mm-hmm. son, not 14-year-old son, but the 18-year-old son of X donating the full amount to, to um, this party? But it that's going on all the time. And it's that that actually, that when you, you know, I've seen it with my own eyes and those things, that does walk up against the line of illegality in my opinion um it's a great it's, it's a great area. you're not supposed to be able to if you're a corporation uh or let's say a developer and you say i want to donate you know when you go to a, can, a candidate and say well i'll give you twenty thousand dollars for your campaign well how do you do that well, i'll find 20 people that i can give a thousand dollars to each and they'll donate to your campaign and i'll know that they did it because i'll be able to see at the end of the year you know the name their names on the elections ontario rules and here's the thing there's no way of no like that's that's illegal that's illegal but there's no way of checking that because i'd have to go and say to uh you know i have to go to each one like did you know did roland Tan- did roland tanner give you a thousand dollars to donate to this cause and you say nope and there's no way to prove it it's a it's a I think we saw, uh, was it the federal election or was it the provincial election? There was a business where every single member of a board of directors made the maximum personal donation. And and th- everybody kind of smelled a rat. It's like, well, you know, try and be less blatant. The, the fact is that usually people are less blatant than that. Um, uh, uh, and most businesses don't want to max out the, the amount. But what, that what, kind of thing is just going on. It's completely routine. But here's the thing. It's that, you know, we think we're trying to get... Account, we think it's accountable. The other thing is this third-party advertising. You know, that is, to me, that's more insidious than the the trying to find your way around. Because, you know, in this case with Cameron Crutch, and it's not just Cameron Crutch, I mean, we saw it in, in Burlington with Marianne Mead Ward uh, running, and I'm sure we'll find it, a few other examples as the uh, campaign goes on uh, this time around. But if I got a bone to pick with somebody and I got a deep pockets, there's really nothing stopping me from saying, I'm going to buy up every billboard or I'm going to mail out to every, uh, uh, you know, every riding, you know, Roland Tanner is the worst thing to happen since sliced bread, you know, whatever, whatever it is. I keep picking on you, Roland. I don't mean to. It's just, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's the first name that pops in the head. But like, you know, say like, Cam- Cam- uh, you know, candidate X, is the worst, you know, the worst thing to happen to this city since, you know, uh, you know, ever. And, and you, you, yeah. you pour deep, you pour deep money into that. And it's kind of like, it, then, and then, you know, in, in the case of Marion Mead Ward, you know, when you say, well, who's, who's paying for this? you look at who's registered as the third party? And it's some numbered business account. Like, it's not even like, yeah. oh, it's, it's Joel McLeod is registered as the third party. It's all these numbered business accounts. Like it's, it's a very, it's very easy to set up a very shadow operation that in what, 36, 35, 36 days um, can completely tilt the course of, a, of an election Yeah, because there's no time to scrutinize. Yeah, you might find out afterwards, but what's the worst they do? Oh, they pay a fine. And, and again, I mean, yeah, take, taking that example. So 2018 was the first time 30 party advertisers existed at a municipal level. Uh, and it was something that the, that the liberals had introduced and I don't know why um, it, you know the if, again who who realistically is going to spend the money on this kind of thing well really a municipal government it's only going to be developers you know who are the people who are the people with the big financial interests at municipal levels of government it's it's basically the developers um, and they're the ones who certainly in 2018 were pouring money into third party advertising certainly this one example in Hamilton and it is just one example um, it's a developer who's registering as a third party advertiser you know, um, and third party advertising at every level of government um, in my experience is just universally negative garbage mm. um, I, I know there was kind of a fuss about changes to the law that the PCs had made and actually it was one of the few places where I was like I'm not sure I really disagree with this I'm kind of on the PC side here in that the <laughs> third party advertising is nonsense and sure they were going after the um, the union backed um, family was it the family working families working family coalition yeah 
which is backed by the unions and, and you know people felt that basically the pcs were going after them and they probably were well you know the, the ads that the working families coalition group run are a bu- bunch of dishonest garbage um they just happens happens to be left-wing progressive dishonest garbage um and it, it adds nothing particularly to it you know when the liberals are at their peak it meant that the liberals didn't have to pay to run attack ads because the working families guys were doing it for them you know un uncoordinated and completely legally i'm sure um but, but that was just the fact of the matter um we don't need it you know and if if if, if parties want to run negative ads they should at least have the, the the wherewithal to put their own name on it um so it, it adds nothing um the only people at municipal level who are going to throw money around are 99 times out of 100 people who want to get a building built of one kind or another and again people have a right you know i'm not disputing that people have a right to be a developer and a right to want things built um but the the, the you know the, the the fact that it's so one-sided in terms of the people who have the money and the desire to use that money to by influence or put pressure on uh, politicians is, is is problematic and um it's not like you know that power dynamic doesn't color every single thing that happens at a municipal level one way or another it's almost as if you make it would make sense to just get rid of advertising period like get, get out I'm, I'm gonna throw it there just get rid of it all even the ca- the candidate ads you know, forget the be going into the spectator and buying a full page ad, you know, vote, vote Joel for mayor or whomever, like ban it all, ban it all, ban the third party advertising, ban the signs, signs on lawns. Those are useless and uh, environmental waste, ban it all. And in the age of social media, it costs nothing to tweet out your policy statement or to put oh. out your, your thing up. You could raise money to pay for a website or maybe to to, uh, uh, you know, coordinate that or, or maybe to, p- to buy some flyers for your campaign. Well, better, better than that. I mean, the, the suggestion that, that um, Dave Meslin had for this is, you know, the government knows our mailing addresses. Obviously, the government needs to know everybody's mailing address. We need to know where you live. For some reason, email is not considered part of that deal. It seems to me that every person in the province could easily have an official government recognized email address and then come election time every candidate gets the right to send so either the candidates individually or Mm -hmm. collectively gets the right to send x number of emails to each person who's got the right to vote to provide actual information now the other thing uh, dave uh, uh, suggested was uh, basically like a booklet that would be delivered to every house in the riding or municipality or the ward or whatever with a a catalogue of the candidates running in that ward or that riding uh, with their vote for me so rather than going through this kind of ridiculous um well contest for money a um and you know who who can knock on the most doors and the thing is you know Four years ago, it was starting to be a problem, the number of people who have um, those cameras on their doors. So one of the last ways in which politicians can actually talk to people and make any kind of impression was to knock on the door and catch someone at home. That's going now. Uh, Soon we're all going to have cameras on our doors and no one's Mm going to be answering the door when they see a politician standing there. Um, So we need to have ways in which... um, candidates can communicate now and actually a huge kudos actually to to burlington and burlington council for voting and i can't remember the exact details um but there was something along these lines that they discussed and i believe passed um they also introduced um uh basically donation refunds to to encourage donations from individuals so the same as you get a refund at the provincial or federal level if you make a donation you get 60 percent back or 70 percent back or whatever they they they, uh made that commitment and i believe there was talk and i I need to actually check this um that that they were talking about that kind of uh, approach where information goes to every household rather yeah and, and that's makes all kinds of sense to do that both electronically and 
you know, a small amount of paper, like, you know, every candidate's going to be guaranteed to get their information into every house. That's really all I ever wanted to do as a candidate was reach every person and give them the chance to see who I am uh, and what I'm but that's, all about. And that's what, you know, the, the, what we're talking about is some kind of very basic reforms to the system uh, that I, th I think you're right. I think would just neutralize the power of corporate money in our in our electoral system and you know hey we've both said that you know municipalities are kind of a great way to kind of test drive these things and see how they work it's too late now for this election obviously but you know hopefully some uh some municipalities run the 905 they'll have different somewhat different makeups uh if they are and somebody might hopefully if you're listening give this a shot at the next uh for, for your next uh for your run uh yeah uh, but I see that we're coming up on our on our time for this episode, so I think we're going to call it quits for this one. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for listening. We'll talk with you again next Tuesday. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>that's it for this episode of the 905er thank you for listening as always you can send us your feedback thoughts and concerns or ideas for future episodes to our email info at 905er.ca we'd love to hear from you you can help us keep the 905er going by financially supporting us through patreon as well as paypal visit us at 905er.ca and click on the support tab as well links are in the show notes for your convenience Lastly, you can find us on social media. Search for the underscore 905er on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So long for now. See you next time. most out of this life and optimize your personal wellness then check out the natural man podcast join me host mike c as we explore all areas of human wellness physical mental and emotional learn strategies to optimize your own well-being and be in the driver's seat of your own health remember your doctor works for you learn biohacks neurohacks ways to improve sleep and ways to optimize your body and your mind. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, the Fountain app, and at naturalmanpodcast.com.